Uh, in view of the time, uh, we, we might want to make, move on to the next topic. Sorry about that. The next paper <coughs> is uh, titled Structural Characterization of Aerogels of Chikungunya and Chikungunya Support and Silica. And it's a contribution for, uh, by D.A. Watt, S.C. Rankin, and S. and D.I. Co. from Carnegie Mellon University. We just heard an example of how zirconia can be stabilized by adding a dopant. What I want to do is try to show how zirconia can be stabilized by itself uh, if we synthesize as an aerogel. Aerogels are materials prepared via the saw gel method. And as the name implies, uh, a saw gel synthesis involves the formation of first of saw and then a gel. And at the very descriptive level, in a thousand of two steps, starting with the metal alkoxide, we first add water to the system, leading to hydrolysis. And then the partially hydrolyzed species can condense by eliminating either alcohol or water, resulting in a gel. Now, in a salt gel synthesis, there are various parameters with which we can vary. And here are some listed below. Uh, by controlling these parameters, and I will look at two of them with you in a minute, uh, we can control the properties of the gel. Now, in this synthesis, we're going to end up with a gel encapsulating of a solvent. The subsequent removal of the solvent results in either a zero gel or an aerogel. Now, a zero gel is a material obtained by conventional drying in trying to remove the solvent from the gel. <coughs> In such a case, there's a liquid vapor interface existing inside the core of the materials, and that interface comes with it a surface tension, which tends to collapse the pore. And as I mentioned already, the resulting material is referred to as zero gel. On the other hand, if the solvent can be dried without creating a liquid vapor interface, and in this case, by replacing the solvent with a supercritical extracting solvent, uh, we can maintain the integrity of the network, and hence, stabilize the material as a result of this uh, extra care we take in drying the material. In the specific case of the zirconia synthesis, we developed the following recipe. We started with zirconium anthropoxide as the precursor dissolved in the anthropoxide solvent using a concentration shown in here. Now, in the synthesis, we basically just mix a beaker containing the alcohol and water to a beaker containing the precursor and the acid. Uh, mix stir and allow the saw gel chemistry to take place, leading to a gel. The gel was then supercritically extracted with uh, supercritical CO2. What came out of the extractor was then back in dry uh, at 383K for three hours to get rid of the physical water. And then that material was taken up to high temperatures, uh, at various temperatures for two hours. Can you move up the transparency? Hmm? Can you move up the transparency? Oh, okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, the first thing I want to show you was the effect of the nitric acid amount used in the synthesis um, in affecting the gel time. Now, in this work, the gel time was defined at the time it took for the vortex in the beaker during the stirring to disappear. Physically, what that corresponded to was a drastic increase in the viscosity of the solution at a form of gel. Okay? So what you want to carry with you is the gel time basically uh, measure the, the length of time for the gel to form. Now, here in this one slide, we are looking at both the effect of the acid used in the synthesis as well as the water content uh, in two water to precursor ratio shown. Let's take a look at the bottom curve. When we use a molar ratio of 4 to uh, 1, we found out that unless we added nitric acid to the system, we could not even form a gel. What happened is the alkoxide precipitated out of solution immediately. In order to slow down that condensation, what we have to do is to add acid to the system. What the acid does is to protonate the OH group, 
making the alkoxide less reactive enhances the chance to cross-link, thus leading to an increase in gel time as shown. And notice that by varying the acid content, we could vary the gel time by several orders of magnitude. The same happened when we roll back the water content from a molar ratio of 4 to 2, and what you are seeing there, that is by using less water, that you are basically decreasing the concentration of the possibly hydrolyzed species, and that's another way to control the condensation kinetics. Okay? So by either varying the condensation rate through the amount of acid or the, the concentration of hydrolyzed species, we in essence have quite a wide control over the time it took for the solution to gel, and as you shall see in a minute, the resulting property as we take this material to various calcination temperatures. In fact, the first property we look at was the surface area of the materials. Remember now these are all aerogels, again, as a function of the nitric amount uh, used. Now what is implicit in this plot, plot of course, is the gel top, which was shown on the, in the previous slide. Again, in the two concentration of water used in the synthesis, we can see that the surface area is the strong function of the acid amount. Now, the point of reference here is that all these aerogels were calcined at 773K for two hours. We take that as an arbitrary standard calcination because that was the usual uh, treat heat treatment conditions. So as you can tell, that when the acid amount was too low, we have a surface area about 90 meters square per gram after that calcination temperature, which was nothing to sneeze at for Seconia. But we could increase the surface area by quite a bit by just changing the acid amount a lot. But you can also did a good thing with increasing acid amount. Again, the surface area of the calcine sample decreased because of the physical characteristic of the gel. I will return to that point uh, in a minute. Now, from this point on, we are now going to focus on the material done at this acid content because this material happened to have the highest surface area under this calcination condition. Well, the first thing we try to look at is the stability of the material with respect to calcination temperature in terms of both the BET surface area, which is shown on the lab axis, as well as the pore volume of the corresponding product shown on the right. Not surprisingly, both the surface area and pore volume decrease with increasing calcine temperature. <coughs> Notice that the material straight out of the extractor, i.e. one that was just critically dry, has a surface area of about 300 meters square per gram. By the time you reach about 773K, which was shown earlier, that's a sample with a surface area of about 120 or 130 meters square per gram. Now, this material was not stable at still higher calcination temperature as shown by the rapid drop uh, near the high temperature end that we look at, and correspondingly, we saw this decrease in pore volume as the material uh, center. I just want to show you the pore size distribution of these materials at three uh, temperatures to give an idea of the evolution of the pore structure. Um, this solid curve is what came out of the extractor, i.e. the SCE sample. By the time we calcined it, it became like this, and at 1173K, along with the collapse in pore volume surface area, uh, at extractor, there's a shift in the pore size distribution uh, towards the higher end. Now, as the material centers, what happened to the structure? What I'm showing you here on the top are the X-ray diffraction pattern of the material heated for two hours under the condition shown. And at the bottom are the corresponding Raman spectra of these materials. Um, and T is the tetragonal phase of the material, and M is the monoclinic phase of the material. And I thank our previous speaker for defining this for me, because as you can tell, what came out of the extractor is a uh, X-ray amorphous material even at 673K, there's still no evidence of crystallization into the T phase. At 773K, we see nothing but T zirconia, and then the T to M transformation uh, with successively higher heat treatment uh, temperature. Uh, the Raman spectra basically is there to reinforce the structural assignment. It turns out that for zirconia, X-ray is not a good technique to differentiate the tetragonal and cubic form because they have very similar diffraction patterns 
uh, Raman help us to resolve that uncertainty in the structural assignment. So when we take this material out of the extractor, this was X-ray amorphous, and when heated up, it goes through first the tetragonal phase and then into the monoclinic phase. Now, let me then compare this material with a commercial sample. And in this case, our comparison was made with the degusa zirconia uh, supplied to us by degusa, and that material was synthesized by the high temperature hydrolysis of the chloride. Now, again, I'm reproducing for you the change in BET surface area as a, as a function of calcination temperature, which is on the aerogel, and at the bottom, the degusa sample. Now, at low temperature, and by that I mean anything below about uh, 800 degree K, our aerogel sample has a high surface area uh, compared to the degusa sample. But I think the point to be taken here is the fact that the stabilization of the synthesis resulted a certain structures that are much cleaner in the sense that it's not a mixture of phases. For example, the S extractor sample, as I told you, was X-ray amorphous. When we heat the material to 730 K, is it a pure tetragonal phase? By contrast, the commercial degusa sample is a mixture of the tetragonal monoclinic phase. And when we heat the material to 1173 K, despite the fact that we have a large decrease in surface area, we have uh, predominantly a uh, pure monoclinic phase, whereas again, the degusa sample is a mixed phase. Now, the importance of that is now through this synthesis, we could stabilize zirconia into a single phase structure Therefore, to have a reference point if we are interested in using this material to relate the structure to the property. Let me return to the structural evolution for a minute because I think there's something interesting here. As pointed out earlier, when you look at the phase diagram of zirconia, um, at atmospheric pressure, the low temperature stable bulk phase is actually the monoclinic phase. As you took this phase to higher temperature, the transformation happened at around 1450K into the tetragonal phase. But as I told you already, that our materials, as they were heated, transformed first into the tetragonal phase, which often has been referred to as the metastable phase. Now, the tetragonal to monoclinic transformation of zirconia has been widely studied. There have been various models proposed as to what caused it. Um, one possible explanation is what's known as a crystallized eye effect in the sense that small crystallized zirconia has surface free energy that is sufficiently different to compensate for the bulk of thermodynamics. Well, we actually got fooled by that argument for a while until we did the following experiments. And I would like to present some evidence arguing against the crystallized size effect in stabilizing zirconia in the, tetra uh, the tetragonal form. Now, this is kind of a busy slide, but stay calm. First, focus your attention on the upper panel in which we are looking at the phase volume percent of the sample as a function of two things. One, gel time, okay? So we're using gel time as a variable to make samples of different physical characteristics, and then we took those samples through the following heat treatment as shown and then look at the transformation at the end of the heat treatment. Now, regardless of gel time, all the materials are stabilized in the tetragonal form after 773K. All material crystallized into the monoclinic form at 1173. What's interesting is the volume fraction of the tetragonal form shown, shown here in the lower shape it itself is a function of gel time. Okay? Now, you then focus your attention on the bottom graph on which we are now plotting the crystallized sizes of the various materials shown up here as a function of gel time, crystallized size being determined by X-ray line broadening. There were a couple of interesting observations that would argue against the crystallized size effect. The first one is the precipitated sample, which corresponds to a zero gel time because this thing just fell out of the solution, actually has a larger particle size than a lot of the samples that actually come from the aerogel, but it was stabilized at a tetragonal form. Okay? Another observation is as we change the gel time and thereby change the crystallized size of the material upon heat treatment, one would expect 
the, um, the fraction of tetragonal form to go the other way if crystallized my size is the only parameter in stabilizing tetragonal secondary. So those two arguments suggest that something else is going on. So what is that something else? Well, let's return to the characterization of this series of samples. I showed you earlier the change in surface area as a function of gel time. And now I add on this plot the corresponding change in the pore volume as a function of gel time. So again, they map uh, at intermediate gel time. We have a maximum pore volume and surface area. And both of them fall off at either side of that maximum. And at the same time, when you look at the product, the pore size distribution as determined by nitrogen desorption data, what we find that is at zero gel time, when we have a precipitate, we have a very wide pore size distribution centering at about 200 to 300 angstrom. As we start lengthening the gel time by adding acid to it, we saw a move of that side distribution towards a much narrower size, as well as the much narrower side distribution. But as we allow the gel time to go even further, it moved back. Now, so there are two things going on here. One is the particle size. The other thing is the response of these various size particles to heat treatment. And what we are suggesting to reconcile all these observations is the fact that not only do you have to worry about the size of the particle in facilitating the transformation, you also have to worry about the quality of the particle. And by quality, I mean defects. Now, if you look at this cartoon here, what I'm showing you is what we think is happening for the precipitate, the, the intermediate gel time, and the long gel time sample. All the red dots or lines correspond to what we think to be the defect densities in the particles. When the particles tear out the solution very rapidly under salt gel time, we postulate that it contains a lot of defects. Okay? And these defects are what's necessary to facilitate the tetragonal to monoclinic transformation. As we increase the gel time, we actually slow down the condensation rate such that the particle side goes down a little bit but there's still quite a bit of defect in it. And as the gel time increases further, then the particles do grow upon sintering, but because the, we allow them to come a solution slower, they actually uniformly sinter into a particle of quote unquote higher quality. Now, the point I'm trying to stress here is when we look at particle size effect, there is a microscopic aspect of it, which is the X-ray determined size, and a microscopic aspect of it, which is tied to the way how these materials come out of the solution. Now, let's switch gear a little bit in the last few minutes that I have to talk about now that we understand a little bit about how Ciccone aerogel is formed, that we can then dope it, just as in the previous talk, with another material, in this case, silica. Now, if you try to co-gel Ciccone with another species, the following complication arises. If you try to co-gel zirconium with silicon, in this case, the two precursors that we use, the zirconium propoxide and the silicon ethoxide, have very different reactivities. Those of you who have done soil gel chemistry know that it's very difficult to gel silica because it's not a very reactive species. On the other hand, the zirconium alkoxide is so reactive that if you're not careful that upon exposure to room air, you will form a precipitate. And that's how different they are. Now, when you try to bring these two precursors together then, and then your goal is to have a homogeneous mixture, then it's tough, because you have a species that likes to react in a hurry, and one that doesn't like to react as fast. Now, this games have been played by many people doing soil gel synthesis, and one technique is to simply let the slowly, is to take the last reactant alkoxide goes first, and in this case, the silicon precursor, in a step called prehydrolysis. Now, prehydrolysis is a very simple concept. You basically let the last reactive species react with water for a little while before the carbon dioxide was introduced. Okay? So in this particular synthesis, we have two approaches. In, in one case, we use the technique that I just described to you, the prehydrolysis, and then we add it to the other alkoxide and then form the gel, and then we compare to the non-prehydrolyzed sample 
one in which the two alkoxy are mixed together right from the beginning. Now, let's first focus our attention on the series of samples involving prehydrolysis. We have already seen the importance of gel time in affecting the properties of an aerogel. So in this series of samples, we kept our gel time to about 30 seconds, controlled by varying the acid amount. As long as we carry the prehydrolysis of this silicon, we have evidence that the silica are pretty well dispersed within the cornea, and the evidence in this case is the reductation of the structural transformation from the amorphous phase into the tetragonal phase as we heat the material up and monitor with DTA. As you can see with increasing silica content, that, that structural transformation was retarded, and only 5% of silica could retard that transformation by up to 80 degrees Celsius. Not only does silica affect the initial amorphous to tetragonal transformation, it also affects the subsequent tetragonal to monoclinic transformation. So if you look at this particular graph, in which we are looking at the X-ray of the resultant material as the calcination temperature is shown in going from left to right, and with increasing silica content from going from bottom to the top, you can see that at the low temperature, 5% of silica completely compressed, suppressed the amorphous to tetragonal transformation, and at an intermediate temperature, it completely suppressed the subsequent transformation into the monoclinic phase. Now, the problem is a little more complicated than that. Because, in a sense, we are not making a fair comparison. One sample was made without another alkoxy, another sample was made with prehydrolysis. So we devised the following synthetic scheme to look at the problem a little more carefully. This is what we refer to as a staircase synthesis, and let me explain that to you. What we did was to take the two precursor, look at the gel time it took for a prehydrolyzed sample to gel, then took away that step, keep all other conditions constant, and simply allow the gel time to free flow to whatever it wants to go. We then added acid back to the system, and as you know, acid will slow down the condensation, and then bring the prehydrolysis back in to let it catch up. So that can be explained better by looking at this schematic diagram in here, that in which we take a specific acid ratio, uh, make a sample of prehydrolysis, take it away, allow the gel time to rise, move the gel time constant by adding acid, and put the precursor back in, and then we can repeat it in many cycles uh, to give us the following. What it gives us is now the ability to compare hydrolysis at a constant gel time and at a constant acid ratio. What we found was the following. If we now look at the two series of samples where NPH refer to non prehydrolyzed and pH referred to the prehydrolyzed sample. And as a point of reference, I'm putting back here the surface area as a function of gel time curve for zirconia. We saw the following. First of all, the addition of silica to zirconia did stabilize zirconia in the sense that after the same calcination temperature, the surface area remained higher. Not a lot higher, higher still. The second observation was the fact that there is indeed a series a, sorry, a difference between the two series. In other words, even at constant gel time, the physical properties depend on whether you take a prehydrolysis in or out of the system. And, not surprisingly, when you now compare the pore size distribution of these samples at different gel times, then it got very interesting. What we are seeing here is the pore size distribution of the Ciconia syllable aerogels, calcium again, at the reference temperature, at three gel times. Let's focus our attention first on the samples that are not prehydrolyzed. You notice that the pore size distribution remain reasonably constant. I mean, there's some movement a little bit, but by and large, it's not a strong function of gel time. On the other hand, if we allow prehydrolysis to take place as a function of gel time, then with increasing gel time, the pore size distribution shifted upwards in exactly the same direction that we saw pure zirconia. Okay? Now, a simple interpretation of that is we prehydrolysis by allowing the silica to go first 
we are actually incorporating silica in the Sikonia matrix so well as Sikonia in terms of the physical evolution of the structure doesn't even know the silica is there. Now, this is also borne out by looking at the crystallization behavior of all these samples, and there's a tremendous amount of information in here. I won't go through all of them because I don't understand all of them. But the point again is the following. By doing our staircase synthesis, we have at our disposal now a way to compare the effect of hydrolysis as a function of structural evolution as we heat the material up, along with it, the ability to compare the effect of gel time to see how these particles actually grow as we control the condensation of how this material comes off the solution. Now, to make a long story short, that we see from the structural data the same evidence, i.e., with prehydrolysis, the mixed sample behave as if it's a pure zirconia <coughs> without the prehydrolysis. There's something going on that we do not understand entirely. Well, I have tried to make three points today. The first one is factual, being that we have synthesized a high surface area zirconia aerogel that has a surface area of about 120 meters square per gram that is a pure tetrahedral phase. It is factual, but it's not an insignificant fact because I think that opens up a lot of possibility in terms of using it as a support. And in fact, some of the work we are now doing is to promote that with sulfate and to try to characterize the behavior in solid super acids. The two subsequent points I think are very interesting from a synthetic viewpoint. One of them is even though gel time has not been recognized as something that varies, I think we have now some evidence that we can actually use that as a tuning parameter to control the quality of the material in terms of defect densities. And along with that, the crystallized size distribution of the particles as they come off solution. I think this is something that needs to be followed up on. I think this actually gives us something to tune other than the other. In fact, when we look at all the other salt gel parameters, we should probably focus on their effect on this one parameter, namely the gel time. Finally, I think we have developed an interesting synthetic protocol that allow us to look at the effect of prehydrolysis and gel time systematically as we dose the cornea uh, with silica. So to end, I'd just like to uh, thank my colleague Bill Hammett for allowing me, us to touch his Raman uh, spectrometer, uh, Degusa for supplying uh, the sample, and NSF and Taxable Foundation for the support. Thank you. We have time for questions or comments. If not, uh, let's thank the. Do you have a question? Let's thank uh, the speaker once more.